The Genesis Account of Origins, Part 4. Uh, we've been talking about a couple of books, uh, Genesis Account of Origins, uh, the Genesis Creation Account and Reverberations in the Old Testament, uh, the more uh, detailed book, which is the one we're actually going through, and then also, uh, and on a less technical level, he spoke and it was Divine Creation in the Old Testament. And... Uh, they're the covers of those two books. Um, the Genesis account of origins, we're going to be talking about chapter 3, part 4. We've been through parts 1 through 3 earlier. And this is uh, written by Richard Davidson at Andrews University. Again, I have to say I admire his writing. Um, there is no spare verbiage there. Um, the two creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2, identical, contradictory, or complementary, is our first topic. There will be two major topics and then uh, a minor topic in the subsidy and then uh, others kind of miss, hit and miss at the end. Um, he starts out by saying, Sailhammer, who's, uh, and I think that's actually misspelled there, it's Hammer, M-M-E-R, has also mistakenly identified the global creation week of Genesis 1 with the creation of the, of the localized Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, 4b and following verses. So he's arguing they're not exactly identical. Uh, contra Salehammer, it should be recognized that in the complementary creation account of Genesis 2, 4b through 25, the introductory not yet verses 5 and 6 continue the global usage of the earth of the Genesis 1 account uh, in describing the four things that had not, been, had not yet appeared on the surface of the planet before the entrance of sin, thorns, agriculture, cultivation or irrigation, and rain. But then Genesis 2-7, uh, describing the creation of Adam, gives the time frame of the Genesis 2 creation account, that is, corresponding with the sixth day of the creation week of Genesis 1. The rest of Genesis 2 depicts in more detail the activities of God on the sixth day of creation week and is largely localized within the Garden of Eden. Others have gone to the opposite extreme and have posited that Genesis 1 and 2 present radically different and contradictory accounts and that Genesis 2 recapitulates all, or most, of creation week rather than just day 6. Such a position often betrays a belief in the documentary hypothesis, source criticism, and two different redactors at work in the two accounts. Um, actually, it's not so much the documentary hypothesis. Um, in any documentary hypothesis, it's a documentary hypothesis that puts us all late and not um, authoritative. Jacques Ducan's dissertation and William Shea's literary analysis, among other important studies, provide evidence that Genesis 1 and 2 are the product of a single writer and present complementary theological perspectives on the creation of this world, with Genesis 1 providing a portrayal of the global creation as such, and Genesis 2 focusing attention on humanity's personal needs. Several recent studies discuss in detail alleged contradictions between the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 creation accounts and show how the supposed co contradictions actually constitute complementary, complementarity in present, presenting a unified and integrated portrayal of creation. As already referred to above, the four things mentioned as not yet in Genesis 4-5 do not contradict Genesis 1, but simply list those things that had not yet appeared on the surface of the planet before the entrance of sin. That is, thorny plants, agriculture, cultivation or irrigation, and rain. Uh, rain is apparently not the ideal way to water the earth, uh, at least according to Genesis 2. Jerry Muscala and Randall Yonker point out that all these items are mentioned in anticipation of Genesis 3 when after the fall they will come into the picture of human reality. Um, there was not a man to till the ground means man didn't have to work hard. 
Note that neither of the expressions plant of the field or herb of the field, sia hasadeh or asib hasadeh, used in Genesis 2, 5, in, is, is found in Genesis 1, um, where uh, different, uh, different phrases are found. Where, while the phrase herb of the field, or asib hasadah, Asadeh, I'm sorry, appears in Genesis 3.18, thus linking it to after the fall and referring to cultivated agricultural products eaten by humans as a result of their laborious toil. There's a little bit of a backstory that probably should be emphasized here that, that, uh, that Davidson doesn't get into. When God planted a garden, a garden is what kings have. A garden is a very easy thing to take care of. Prune it a little bit here and there and you get fruit. Um, uh, a field takes a lot more work. You have to plow it, you have to plant it, you have to uh, weed it, and then finally you get to harvest it, um, all of which takes a lot more work than, say, getting stuff from a grapevine or from a fig tree. And you'll remember that uh, when Israel is promised wonderful things, uh, Every man gets to live under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Um, having a vine and a fig tree at my home and not uh, having to plant wheat is, uh, uh, but having been around farmers, uh, there's quite a bit of difference in the amount of effort required, even today with tractors. Um, another and perhaps the major alleged contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2 is the apparent difference in the order of creation between the two accounts. In Genesis 1, the order is vegetation, day 3, birds, day 5, animals, day 6, and then humans, male and female, day, day 6. Genesis 2 appears to give a different order. Man, verse 7, vegetation, verse 8 and 9, animals and birds, verse 19, and finally woman, verses 21 and 22. For the vegetation, I'm sorry, that's somehow that got cut in or cut out when it shouldn't have. Uh, the two main issues here relate to the different order Something really got cut out. Maybe I should get the book at this point. Um, and I thought I'd read that through and made sense of it. Um, In Genesis 1, the order is vegetation, day 1, birds and animals, yes. In Genesis 2, appears to give a different order, man, vegetation, animals and birds, and woman. The two main issues here relate to, one, the different order uh, for the vegetation, and two, the different order for the animals and birds. The apparent contradiction re regarding the vegetation disappears when it is recognized that Genesis 1, 11 and 12 describes how God how in response to God's creative word, word, the earth brought forth vegetation, including the fruit trees, while in Genesis 2, 8 through 9, God planted a special garden, and out of the ground he caused to grow, or tzamah, additional specimens of various kinds of fruit trees that he'd already created out on day three of creation week. At least two possible explanations have been suggested for the apparent contradiction regarding the order of the creation of birds and animals. The first is, simply, is to simply translate the perfect form of Yatsar as an English pluperfect had formed. In Hebrew, there are only two um, tenses. There's the perfect and the imperfect, and that's it. And so the perfect oftentimes... Uh, is used in multiple senses. Um, 
sometimes better translated, imp, uh, better translated as the as a pluperfect rather than a perfect, or sometimes better translated and commonly better translated as a simple past. Um, now the Lord God had formed, so this is just taking one of the part of the semantic range and using it instead of the standard uh, uh, past, out of the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And uh, he brought them is the standard past tense. And it's the same tense that's being used here. But, uh, but in this particular uh, thing, the Lord God had formed is part of the semantic range. It's not the usual but it can be done. This is a legitimate translation of the Hebrew perfect inflection, which refers to completed action, but may be translated as a simple past, a perfect, or a pluperfect, according to context. With the translation as a pluperfect, Genesis 2, 19, is supplying necessary information in order to tell the story of Adam's naming of the animals and at the same time implying that the creation of the animals had taken place at an earlier time, but without giving precise chronological order of this creation. Um, I'm assuming there should be an an in there somewhere, or the. Um, another possible explanation for the different orders, order of animals and birds is set forth by Kasuto, who suggests that, like the planting of the special trees in the Garden of Eden on day six, apart from the general creation of vegetation on day three, according to Genesis 2.19, God is involved in a special additional creation of animals and birds beyond what was created earlier on the fifth and sixth days. However, because of the fivefold use of the word kol, that should be italicized because that's a um, Hebrew word, all or every, in Genesis 2, 19 and 20, all the wild animals, all the birds in the NIV, I, that is Davidson, prefer the former explanation to the latter. Um, but it, it uh, all or every wouldn't, uh, is not necessarily an absolute. And so if God created a few things, Kasuto could still be right. Just that uh, Davidson is more comfortable with uh, translating had formed. And so that's how he uh, harmonizes Genesis 1 and 2, which, are, which is uh, one of the uh, major um, major points that is raised by those who disagree uh, that Genesis 1 and 2 can be harmonized at all. Uh, we have a comment. Uh, can we pass the mic back? I think that uh, you kind of hit the uh, ball straight at one point, which you were saying. I just don't see that much difference where we say he spoke it into existence or he planted it. Uh, we usually have the concept, if you plant, you use your hands. Um, but in God's case, uh, apparently his abilities are way beyond anything we can think of. And describing it either way, basically he says that uh, he made them. That raises an interesting question. Do we translate that with the pluperfect as well? Now God had planted. And that's a possibility. The other possibility is that, that after Adam was created, God said, now here's what I'm going to make for you. And he makes it right in front of him. Uh, in which case... Why not do the same with the birds and animals, uh, which would be uh, Kasuto's reading. The, the point of it is, and I think this is an important point, is that one is not required by the Hebrew to make these two uh, accounts contradictory to each other in that regard. And I think that the, the major question is, do the two accounts fit together well or not? If they fit together well otherwise, then I think that a harmonizing interpretation, one of the two that has been suggested, is appropriate. And 
if they don't fit together well, then uh, it's uh, perfectly appropriate to say, well, here's another instance where they don't fit together well. But your view of how to translate and how to understand that part of Genesis 1 and 2 uh, is strongly influenced by how you see Genesis 1 and 2 in general. Um, yeah. Uh, another thing is, no, another uh, possibility I see is that maybe, uh, for instance, the tree of life, uh, did he go down and plant that and create it with his hands? Because there's times, you know, God wrote commandments with his fingers. Um, another time he spoke things into existence. Maybe he used both techniques. Yeah, well, you know, so it's a kind of interesting possible. because when God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, it doesn't actually say God formed man with his hands. So we have to be careful about, uh, uh, about uh, I mean, that's how we normally, we image it. We think of God as stooping down and molding a face and molding arms and legs and so forth. Um, but it doesn't actually say that. Um, it, the, the, the verb that's used pictures a potter molding clay. But it's, um, you know, how literally should you take that when you're discussing God is a problem. Anyway, now we're going to another part that uh, a lot of people are interested in, the light, the greater light and lesser lights and the stars. On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. He named the light day and the darkness night. However, on the fourth day of creation, we, God ordered into existence lights in the firmament of the heaven to give lights on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. What was the source of the light that illuminated our planet before the fourth day? Well, that one's possibility is that God's presence was already was the source of light on the first day of creation. This is already hinted at in the literary linkage between Genesis 1:4 and Genesis 1:18. In verse 4, God himself is the one who divided the light from the darkness, while in verse 18, it is the luminaries that are to divide the light from the darkness. By juxtaposing these two clauses with exactly the same Hebrew words and word order, the reader is invited to conclude that God himself was the light source for the first three days, performing the function that he gave to the sun and moon on the fourth day, whereafter he apparently stepped back and let the sun and moon do the job. Another important indicator of this interpret uh, explicit, implicit indicator of this interpretation is found in the intertextual linkage between Genesis 1 and Psalm 104, the latter being a stylized account of the creation story following the same order of description as in the creation week of Genesis 1. Now, I would caution to take this with a little grain of salt because it's a very highly poetic story and there are a couple of things that when we get to that we'll find out that are, uh, um, uh, shall we say, modernized. Um, but in, in, in the section of Psalm 104, paralleling the first day of creation, that is verse 2, God is depicted as covering himself with light as with a garment, thus implying that God is the light source of the first days of creation week. Now, again, that's not really hard, but it is kind of a, a soft indication. During the first three days, God himself could have separated the light from the darkness just as he did at the Red Sea, where there was light where he was and darkness where the Egyptians were. God himself being the light source for the first part of the week emphasizes the theocentric, God-centered, not heliocentric or sun-centered nature of creation. And thus God proleptically forestalls any temptation to worship the sun or moon that might have been encouraged if the luminaries had been the first objects created during the creation week. To uh, paraphrase the, uh, the movie uh, line, uh, God don't need no stinking sun. <laughs> um, 
A second option suggests that the sun was created during, before the fourth day, but became visible on that day, perhaps as a vapor cover was removed. This would explain the evening and morning cycle before day four. So this is two different models. Sailheimer correctly points out that the Hebrew syntax of Genesis 1.14 is different from the syntactical pattern of the other days of creation in that it contains the verb to be in the Joseph plus the infinitive, whereas the other days have only the verb without the infinitive. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, let grass spring forth. Or, or if you wanted to really be literal, let sprouts sprout forth. Um, the verb and the, uh, and the noun there, cognate. Uh, but the interesting part of it is that here it is not let the lights light, but rather let the lights be light or be too light. That sounds like splitting hairs there. It, well, it's, it's interesting, and the question is why did they do it that way? Right. And, uh, and the suggestion is made that maybe this is a hint that, um, that uh, there's something different going on with this than with the rest of it. Thus he suggests that verse 14 should read, let the lights in the expanse be for separating. Not as usually translated, let there be lights in the expanse and let them separate. Um, such a subtle but important in syntactical shift may imply, Salehammer suggests, that the lights were already in existence before the fourth day. The greater and lesser lights could have been created in the beginning, that is before creation week, Genesis 1.1, and not on the fourth day. On the fourth day they were given a purpose to separate the day from the night and to mark seasons and days and years. I'll come back to that when we uh, uh, get, come my take. Seilhammer's suggestion does rightly recall attention to a possible difference of syntactical nuances with regard to the wording of the fourth day, but it is not without its own difficulties. Most, seriously, most serious is that Seilhammer views verse 16 not as part of the report of creation, but as a commentary pointing out that it was God and not anyone else who had made the lights and put them in the sky. I find this... Sailhammer has the sun existing before the first day of creation, so that's why you have to you have to view things from his perspective that way. Um, I find this objection overcome if one accepts a variant of this view in which verse sixteen is indeed part of the report and not just commentary. According to this variant, the sun and moon were created before creation week, as Sailhammer suggests, but Unlike Salehammer's view, they were created in their tohu unformed and bohu or unfilled state, as was the earth. So presumably the sun was there, but not giving out light at that point. Um, and on the fourth day, were further made, asa, into their fully functional state, verse 16. And that, I missed a uh, putting up a footnote there. Uh, what about the stars? Were they created on the fourth day or before? In the second option mentioned above, we note, noted how the Hebrew syntax of Genesis 1.14 may indicate that the sun and moon were already in existence before the fourth day, and thus could have been created in the beginning, before creation week. Uh, verse 1. The same could also be true of the stars. Furthermore, the syntax of Genesis 1.16 doesn't require the creation of the stars on day four, and in fact, by not assigning any function to the stars, such as given to the sun and the moon, they may be seen as a parenthetical statement. Remember, the story is the greater light to rule the day, lesser light to rule the night, and purposive, and then all of a sudden at the end of the verse, and the stars. Um, uh, and... Um, now, this is, of course, the English, he made the stars also. It's actually literally and the stars. 
uh, without indicating when. So he's going to say, yeah, there's two, two lights. And by the way, he created the stars as well. Uh, Colin House has argued, and this is a really interesting study, that in Genesis 1.16, the stars are presupposed as already in existence before creation week, and that this is indicated by the use of the Hebrew particle wa'et. Now, it's, there's a slight difference in pronunciation. Instead of wa'et, which is the standard way, um, uh, which is used in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, wa'et ha'aretz. Uh, this is what et, and et is a sign of the direct object, whereas eight actually is a preposition meaning with. So he finds that throughout Genesis to mean together with, uh, usually meaning something that has already been there. And for example, the example that's given, Jacob was buried with. Uh, Leah and Abraham was buried with Isaac or pardon me with uh, Sarah and Rebecca with Isaac and so there's this wa'et not meaning uh, Abraham and Isaac as much as Abraham with I uh, pardon me not Abraham and Sarah as with Abraham with Sarah who had already been there um And uh, so the thought, the thought is that specifically it wouldn't be uh, uh, the uh, timing of the two would not, be co uh, would not have to be coterminous. They didn't get both buried at the same time. And usually the one who died first is listed as uh, the, one who is, uh, the, died, the one who died second is listed as buried with, uh, with the one who died first. The lesser light to rule the night, to rule uh, together with the stars. As noted above, several passages of scriptures suggest that celestial bodies and intelligent beings were created before life was brought into existence on this planet. And this would correlate with the implications that emerged from Genesis 1.16. My only discomfort with that a little bit is oh, what, the, what the particle and is doing in that context. Uh, but, and then he goes on to death or predation before sin. Do the, uh, do the Genesis creation accounts allow for the possibility that death or predation existed on planet Earth before the fall and the entrance of sin described in Genesis 3? In answer to this question, we must first reiterate our conclusion regarding the active gap or ruin restoration theory discussed under the when of creation. This theory, which allows for long ages of predation and death before the creation week, described in Genesis 1, 3 to 31, cannot be grammatically sustained by the Hebrew text. Genesis 1 simply cannot be translated, the earth became without form and empty. That at least, uh, well, taking it straightforwardly. As we have seen above, there is room in the text for, and I believe the text actually favors, a passive gap in which God created the universe, the heavens and the earth, in the beginning, before creation week. And the earth at this time was tohu unformed and bohu unfilled, and darkness was on the face of the deep. But such description does not imply a negative condition of chaos, as has often been claimed, only that creation was not yet complete. Well, there's some organization, obviously, because there's water on top of everything. Furthermore, the terms tohu, unformed, and bohu, unfilled, in Genesis 1, 2, imply a sterile, uninhabited waste with no life, no birds, animals, or vegetation. So not, uh, not only is there no death on this world before creation week, but there is also no life. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 thus make no room for living organisms to be present upon planet Earth before creation week, let alone death and predation. According to Genesis 1 and 2, death is not part of the original condition or divine plan for this world. 
Dukan's insightful discussions of death in relation to Genesis 1 and 2 reveals at least three indicators that support this conclusion. First, at each stage of creation, the divine work is pronounced good. And at the very last stage, it is pronounced very good. Humanity's relationship with nature is described in positive terms of dominion, which is a covenant term without a nuance of abuse or cruelty. Uh, we'll come back to that next week. Uh, the text explicitly suggests that animal or human death and suffering are not a part of the original creation situation. As it indicates the diet prescribed for both humans and animals to be the pro products of plants, not animals. This peaceful harmony is also evident in Genesis 2, where animals are brought by God to the man to be named by him, thus implying companionship, albeit incomplete and inadequate, of the animals with humans. And not as good as the woman, but, uh, but at least companions. Like you name uh, your dog, and uh, he's yours at that point. Uh, a second indicator that death is not part of the picture in Genesis 1 and 2 is the statement of Genesis 2, 4b through 6, that at the time of the creation, the world was not yet affected by anything not good. Yonker has shown that the four things that were not yet in existence all came into the world as a result of sin. One, the need to deal with thorny plants. Two, the annual uncertainty and hard work of the grain crop. Three, the need to undertake the physically demanding plowing of the ground, and four, the dependence on the uncertain but essential life-giving rain. Dukan points out a number of other terms in the Genesis creation narratives that constitute a prolepsis, the use of a descriptive word in anticipation of its being applicable, showing what is not yet but will come. Allusions to death and evil, which are not yet, may be found in the reference to dust, to which humans will return in death. The mention of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in anticipation of the confrontation with and experiencing of evil, the human's task to guard the garden, shamar, implying the risk of losing it, and compare that with verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 23, where they are expelled, and instead of them guarding the garden, the cherubim, guard its entrance, same word, shamar. And the play on words between naked and cunning, the man and woman were naked and were not ashamed, and then virtually the same word, using the serpent was more cunning than uh, any other uh, creature. Um, Though alluded to by prolepsis, the negative or not good conditions, including death, are not yet. A third indicator that death was not a reality prior to sin, nor what God intended as part of the divine plan, is that Genesis 3 portrays death as an accident, a surprise, which turns the original picture of peace and harmony in Genesis 1 and 2 into conflict. Within Genesis 3, after the fall, we have all of the harmonious relationships described in Genesis 1 and 2 disrupted between man and himself, guilt, a recognition of soul nakedness that cannot be covered by externals, between humans and God, fear, between man and woman, blame or discord, and between humans and animals, deceit and conflict, and between humans and nature, decay. Now death appears immediately as an animal must die to provide covering for the human's nakedness and irrevocably for the humans who have sinned. The upset of the ecological balance is directly attributed to the human sin. The blessing of Genesis 1 and 2 has become the curse. Uh, Trig of Mettinger points to the strong contrast regarding death before sin or guilt between the ancient Near Eastern accounts of the Odyssey and the Eden narrative in Genesis 2 and 3. So this is a contrast, um, which means, by the way, that we need to be very, very cautious about using the ancient Near Eastern um, accounts to 
explicate what the Bible really means. Uh, since they are markedly different in certain areas, it raises the question of whether they could not be markedly different in other areas as well. What we have in Mesopotamia is a type of theodicy in which death is not the result of human guilt, but is the way that the gods arranged human existence. And that's uh, uh, Rich, uh, Davidson's uh, ellipses. On the other hand, what we have in the Eden narrative is a theodicy that de derives the anomic phenomena from human guilt. Death is not what God intended, but is the result of human sin. A number of commentators have pointed out that one of the major reasons for God's judgment upon the antediluvian world with the flood was the existence of violence upon the earth. The earth also was corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Interestingly, that word is Hamas. You've probably heard that in another context. Um, this condition of the earth being filled with violence, or Hamas, is repeated again in verse 13. The use of the term Hamas un undoubtedly includes the presence of brutality and physical violence, and with its subject being the earth, probably refers to the violent behavior of both humans and animals. Note the post-flood decrees that attempt to limit both human and animal violence, Genesis 9, 4 through 6. Divine judgment upon the earth for its violence, or Hamas, uh, implies that predation which presupposes violence and death, the all too frequent result of violence, were not part of the creation order. Intertextual allusions to Genesis 1 and 2 later in Genesis confirm that death is an intruder, the result of sin and a consequence of the fall. Dukan points to the striking intertextual parallels between Genesis 1, 28 and 30 and 9, 1 through 4 where God repeats to Noah the same blessing as to Adam using the same terms and in the same order. But after the fall, instead of peaceful dominion as in creation, there will be fear and dread of the humans by the animals, and instead of a vegetarian diet for both humans and animals as in creation, humans are allowed to hunt and eat animals. The juxtaposing of these two passages revealed that the portrayal of conflict and death is not regarded as original in creation, but organically connected to humanity's fall, or at least different after the flood than it is after creation. Perhaps the most instructive intertextual allusions to Genesis 1 and 2 occur in the Old Testament Hebrew prophets and in the last prophets, prophet of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. These messengers of God were inspired to look beyond the present to a future time of salvation, pictured as a recreation of the world as it was before the fall. This portrait, drawn largely in the language of return to the Edenic state, explicitly describes a new or renewed creation of perfect harmony between humanity and nature, where once again predation and death will not exist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den, something that we would never do today, they shall not hurt or nor destroy, presumably speaking of the cobra and the viper, in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, the rebuke of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the mouth of Pardon me, for the Lord has spoken. And those are both from Isaiah. And then in Hosea, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. And that verse has been quoted again in the New Testament in a slightly different form that some of you may remember reading. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? 
And then uh, continuing to in Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. So it's going to be different from what it is now. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Again in Isaiah. And then a few from Revelation. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Promise of Jesus that uh, he has control over death. And then finally, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Presumably meaning the end of death. And uh, finally, and I saw, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. And God will wipe away every tree, tear from their eyes and there will be no more death. No, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall, not be, there shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Several studies have examined these and other re relevant biblical passages and concluded that God created the world without the presence of death, pain, and suffering, and that the subjection to futility spoken of Roman, in Romans 8, 19-21 began in Genesis 3, not in Genesis 1. Other aspects of, what, uh, of the what of creation, i skip over introductory paragraph, the firmament or expanse, the Hebrew word rakia in Genesis 1 does not refer to a metallic hemispheric vault as many have maintained. Based on what is now recognized as a mistranslation of the parallel ancient Near Eastern creation story, Enuma Elish, but is best translated as expanse in all of its usages and has reference to the sky in Genesis 1. The mention of God's placement of the greater light and the lesser light in the rakia does not betray a wholesale acceptance of ancient Near Eastern cosmology on the part of the biblical writer, as often claimed. Rather, the account of Genesis 1 and 2 seems to provide a polemic against major parts of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. The waters above refer to the at upper atmospheric waters contained in the clouds. Creation according to its kind. The phrase according to its kind in Genesis 1 does not imply a fixity of species as Darwin and many others have claimed, rather min or uh, kind refers to a multiplicity of animals and denotes boundaries between basic kinds of animals but is not directly linked directly to reproduction. And this is kind of interesting because Davidson is citing the work of Rachel uh, Schaefer, who happens to be his daughter. <laughs> That's kind of nice when you can uh, cite your, uh, your kids as the, your references. Um, Imago Dei, image of God, humankind is made in the image, or Selim, of God after his likeness, Demut. It, which includes, among other considerations, the relational aspects of humanity, as in the Godhead, the representation in humanity of the presence of God and the resemblance of humans to God in both outward form and inward character. Equality of man and woman. The Genesis creation accounts present the equality of man and woman without hierarchy before the fall and present this as the ideal, even in a sinful world. And uh, that references to one of Davidson's uh, other works. Um, marriage. The Genesis creation account present, accounts present a succinct theology of marriage concentrated in the three, three expressions, leave, be joined to, become one flesh. In Genesis uh, 2 to 24. Earth's first sanctuary. The Garden of Eden is portrayed as a sanctuary temple with Adam and Eve as the priestly officiants. Creation care, a robust theology of creation care, or environmental concerns, emerges from a careful study of Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is set forth in Genesis 2, 1 through 3 as a holy institution rooted in 
and a memorial of the six-day creation. Obviously, he's not going into a full-fledged um, interpretation of any of these, partly because it takes him outside of the bounds of Genesis 1 and 2, and partly because uh, he's already covered some major points. Um, and otherwise, you could write a whole book on what he on Genesis 1 and 2 itself. But this is kind of a nice summary of the major points of uh, a conflict in Genesis 1 and 2. Conclusion, the remainder of Scripture takes up these and other, uh, others and other for his, uh, his wondrous creative works. Praise the Lord who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. O oh, worship him who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. One from Psalms, one from Revelation. Now, my take on this, I agree with most of what Davidson has to say. More can be said on the relationship between the sun and the great light. Uh, I'm going to draw science into it, which Davidson did not want to do, which I can understand. Um, basically, one can interpret the passage either what I would call theologically or with regard to a scientific model. The scientific model first is that there were dense clouds resting upon the surface of the deep to begin with. On the first day, the clouds thinned enough so that light could get through, but only diffusely. You couldn't tell where, any, where the light was coming from, just that there was light. On the second day, they were separated from the surface of the deep, the, the primitive ocean, by air. And on the fourth day, they were clarified enough so that one could see the sun and also the moon. Now, according to one variant of this model, you could see the sun and the moon, but it wasn't really clear enough to really see the stars. While there may have been some haze so that the clouds hid the stars, which may have been added to the story sometime later. In other words, the, that phrase and the stars was actually added after the flood whether by somebody passing it on or by uh, Moses himself, uh, would not be clear. Um, but uh, the, per, perhaps after the flood, when the atmosphere, except for the clouds, completely cleared, that's, that's a possibility of using this kind of a model. Um, the theological model is that God created light before the sun just to show that God don't need no stinking sun. Uh, it is fair to claim, uh, claim that this is the point of that particular structure where the light is created first and then the sun. Now, if you take that route, and there are many people who do, and I, frankly, I now find myself among them, this forces some conclusions on us that are really important to pay attention to. If this was the point of writing things that way. Then there's a theological point being made. There is more than one theological claim in the story. In other words, it's not just about how God created everything, but it is also about how God created things in such a way as to prove that he is God and not dependent on some son. Uh, one cannot then claim that we reduce the story to a simple God made the world and how many days doesn't matter. There's more involved theologically, and we're going to have to take that into account. Now, one must then either accept the text as it reads, more or less, or else you have to reject it as a whole. And there are plenty of people who would like to just simply reject it, but there are other people who try to use, well, you know, God was just making a big theological point, and he didn't, and all of this other stuff is window dressing that can be discarded. And my point is, no, it can't be discarded. At least one of it has a theological point. The second point to make is that the theological point is dependent on the literal accuracy of the count. That is to say, if the theological point is to claim that God doesn't need the Son, then saying that, well, actually he does, undercuts the theological point. So this cannot be mixed with the previous model you're going to have to interpret it one way or the other. And if the theological point is real, 
then the idea of God kind of gradually allowing more and more light on the earth uh, really kind of falls flat. Now, that's not, maybe we shouldn't be making this theological point. Okay, in that case, let's just stand up and say so. Uh, personally, I tend to find the supposed scientific proof that the substance of the earth is old to be quite weak at this point. Um, I thus have no particular problem accepting the strong theological interpretation. For what it's worth, I find that the case for the, uh, the sun's age being what it's commonly claimed to be, quite weak. You can't radiometrically date the sun. There's nothing there to date. It's all plasma. Uh, the kinds of things that you would need to date the sun aren't there. Well, what about the hydrogen-helium ratio? Well, let's come to that. The sun vacuumed up 333,000 times as much mass as the Earth. A thousand times as much mass as Jupiter, but only about 4,000 times as much iron as, and oxygen as the Earth, which is really weird when you think about it, which means that the sun is better at vacuuming up hydrogen than it is oxygen if you follow the standard model. Now, the sun is supposed to have been made of a star that had burned most of its hydrogen fuel into helium and then into larger atoms, right? I mean, this is standard cosmological theory, which means there must have been a lot of helium to begin with, unless the helium somehow burned preferentially, which is weird because it's a lot easier to burn hydrogen into helium than vice versa, than to go on beyond that. Why, in that case, would there not be a significant amount of helium left over by this star that created all the stuff that we have now, not to be also gathered by the sun, and thus the sun would start looking older than it really was, because it started out with helium. The sun's apparent age, then, would be a maximum age, not a real age. If the sun started with helium, Every bit of helium that it started with makes the sun look older than it really is. And yet we are expected to believe that the sun started out with essentially 100% hydrogen. Oh, except for the oxygen and iron and everything else it picked up. That doesn't make sense. From a science, oh, and, and if you wanted to claim that, well, the, the hydrogen was bound by oxygen into water, well, there's not enough oxygen in the sun to make that work. Somehow the sun is vacuuming up hydrogen. Even if you're saying hydrogen-2, that's still heavier than helium-4. Uh, pardon me, lighter than helium-4. So the sun should have taken a bunch of helium in, too. It shouldn't be as old as how it's normally portrayed. Now, from a scientific point of view, the solar system may be young, while the universe may be much older. Um, and by the way, that would mean that some of the stars were created on the fourth day, even if they were in existence before, because we see Jupiter only because of the reflected light of the sun. Science is in the study of the reproducible may not be the ideal way to reach back beyond creation. And it's something to keep in mind. However, science may be better equipped to reach back to the flood and, in fact, some science, including dinosaur remains and carbon-14, and uh, while well, we're at it, uh, paraconformities and, uh, and uh, uh, rates of erosion and, and also uh, a soft sediment deformation, may all now indicate a short age for the flood. And it, while we're at it, we should probably throw in um, a lack of uh, bioturbation. Since soft tissues and dinosaurs, well, that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about, dinosaur remains. So, th so there is actually some pretty good evidence. Really, the truth of the matter is the, the other side is mainly hanging on to radiometric dating. And if there have been changes in the rates of radiometric decay, then all bets are off. Now, the uh, stars deserve more discussion. I'm not, we'll, we'll, we'll see what you want to do with that. 
the documentary hypothesis may be accurate but irrelevant. In other words, there is a proposal that God actually gave the first chapter of Genesis. That's why it is in such good Hebrew. Interestingly enough, the standard theory is that the Hebrew for Genesis 1 is highly polished. That's well recognized. And they put it in the priestly code because it took a long time to polish it that way. But if you ever read the rest of the priestly code, it is boring. Um, it doesn't really fit with the rest of the priestly code. Um, Genesis 1 may be God's account. And then Genesis 2 may be Adam's account of the same thing. And so you have a natural division. A documentary, a proof that there are two documents involved would not prove that the two documents are either contradictory or that they are inaccurate. Death before sin would be precluded by the text except for the 800-pound gorilla. Namely, it took a long time and there must have been death before sin, which, as I said two weeks ago, needs to be taken out and shot. But that's my opinion now. It's your turn. Very good. Thank you. Further comments? I find the uh, half a dozen or so isotopes that uh, decay moderately rapidly and are no longer present like plutonium 234, uh, 244 and... Uh, exactly, that group there. Yeah. I, I find that a, a fairly strong suggestion that there was uh, some matter here before creation week. Uh, I would add to that uh, that I find uh, with some difficulty the inheritance of older dates as a partial answer to the old dates we find, radiometric dates we find uh, in uh, igneous rocks, among the sedimentary rocks, and so on. Uh, there's a body of, of data there that I think that uh, it's probably more easily explained if you believe those are some matter here at the Earth before Creation Week. And uh, that used to be my position until uh, I came up with, uh, I came upon the idea that uh, radi radio radioactive decay rates not only could have been faster in the past, but in fact can be demonstrated to have varied in the present and we haven't a clue as to why. Um, and that's, that's where I kind of, at that point, said, you know, if things, if things decayed faster in the past than, than at present, then the, the phenomena that you're describing, uh, which is well known, um, would be fairly easily uh, understood. I, I would add that we need to be cautious there, of course. <laughs> We're out there... Uh speculating, we all agree that. Uh, if you're going to change the rates of radioactive decay, uh, should you use carbon-14 as a <laughs> case that uh, proves the opposite? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that precise problem came up. Um, uh, when I was discussing things with uh, the ICR people. Um, why do we assume that the carbon-14 didn't accelerate decay? Um, there are two possibilities to that. One of them is it did experience some increase in decay, 
but it was proportional to the number of atoms rather than proportional to the uh, uh, to the present decay rate. That the acceleration was more on uh, atoms that were uh, uh, that that were that had a a slower decay rate because what happens is a percentage of them went uh, decayed rather than a rather than a speeding up of the decay rate proper. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that larger atoms were more greatly affected than smaller atoms. Um, interestingly, beryllium-10 uh, seems to give the people who are working with it fits uh, in terms of how fast things have have decayed. Uh, beryllium-10, of course, is lighter than carbon-14, and I think it's the only isotope outside of tritium, which has a 25-year half-life and is not, that's, that's used for decay rates. So that um, the, that implies that it may be either due to a more rapid decay rate uh, or percentage, or it may also indicate that the lighter elements aren't as affected. Um, one of the things that would be absolutely fascinating from a creationist point of view uh, to do would be to get some uh, meteorites from the Ordovician. They should normally have a certain range of various isotopes, uh, beryllium-10, carbon-14, manganese-53, Aluminum 26, sodium 22, um, <coughs> potassium 40, of course, um, and uh, iodine, I think it's iodine 129. Um, and what would be interesting would be to examine those and see wh whether those isotopes could be found in the meteorites. If there has been accelerated decay, presumably at least some of it happened during the flood, and you would expect all of those isotopes to be gone in the meteorites. If there had not been accelerated decay, you would expect all those isotopes to still be there. If there has been mixed decay, you might expect, say, the heavier isotopes to be gone, but the lighter isotopes to still be there. Or perhaps the longer lived isotopes to be more gone, uh, and the shorter lived isotopes to still be there. Um, I expect carbon-14 to be still found in those meteorites. What, I, what I'm curious about is, what about some of the other isotopes that are in there that are created by spallation by cosmic rays. And so this actually doesn't lead to an impasse where we argue past each other. This leads to a fruitful new area of research, or at least potentially fruitful. And if we get any other answer than all of the isotopes are gone, then not only do we have an interesting answer, but we also have an answer that contradicts the standard, uh, the standard model. Because, of course, by the standard model, those things are 500 million years old and all of the various isotopes that we've been talking about should be gone, except for maybe the longest-lived isotopes, in which case we might find a few of them. I want to build on what my good friend Ariel has said and that's uh, what do you do with these uh, missing isotopes. In other words, uh, radiometric decay appears to have gone through a cycle, and you said, yes, you'll accept that because um, the rates can change. Now, there's probably three different ways that I've seen how this is explained. One is Robert Gentry has said in the Precambrian, which appears to be very old, God created things uh, with the various proportions 
of the decay products. And so it so may have happened during basically an appearance of age. It may have happened during creation week. In other words, yeah. God may have speeded up the atomic clocks, all the clocks. Either on day one or before day one. Either one. Or yep. on the third day when he's creating. Or the third the day. When the, so Gentry puts it in creation week. Uh, Henry Morris and some other ICR people used to say that that is a evidence of the fall when decay rates were changed. You've heard that theory. And then the ICR people are na now saying the decays rates have changed during the flood. And this is connected with the tremendous amount of heat and the volcanism and all of that. So you have three different places that you can put this. And I'm trying to put your model now into one of those three <laughs> slots. And maybe you can help me. Well, uh, to be fair, <laughs> you could take a little from model one and a little from model two and a little from model three. And so True. There, may be, uh, there may be more than one. And I might point out that, uh, to his credit, Henry Pearl suggested model three. He did. That's right. Uh, I'd like to elaborate a little further on Genesis 8. At the end of the flood, Genesis 8:22, there's a promise that things would continue as they were before the flood. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. These are natural cycles, all of them. Some of them connected with astronomy, some of them connected with the rotation of the earth and the moon and and so on. And so it implies that all these cycles were thrown out of kilter during the flood. And then the cycles would pick up then. And so I assume the ICR people would say, yes, agree with you. Uh, we're back to the more normal decay rates after the flood that may have been built into the system at creation. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Or? Kind of, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to be fair, the, the uh, Bible doesn't use the word radioactive decay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, well, are, there, we are speculating here. There are implications. When you're listing various natural cycles uh, of planting, biological, cold and heat, phys physical. physical, and day and night, <laughs> astronomical, when you have three different major types of cycles being restored, can't, can't we just throw in radiometric cycles too? Uh, I, I think one could yeah. do that. I, I, and see, my interest is not so much in building models that will account for what we have. If you have enough variables, you can build a model for anything. True. Um, what I'm really interested in is models that can be constructed and then can be used to predict what will happen if we do specific tests in specific areas. Because that's the essence of science. It's not just building models. It is building models and then being able to use them predictively. Um, uh, testing is just simply the flip side of prediction. Um, and I think we have one down here. Um, and, and so one of, the, one of the things that I'm really interested in is are we going to be able to use this as a prediction. That's why I'm so fascinated with the idea of, of dating meteorites, because we have enough data f from before to say what we would expect from the standard model. And the question is, do we actually find that, or do we find something different? And if we find something different, might it support one of these other models? And so I'd like to develop the models clearly enough so that you could make some kind of at least ballpark predictions as to what you expect. For example, if it's based on atomic weight, then you might expect potassium-40 to be more affected than carbon-14, beryllium to be less affected than carbon-14, beryllium-10, and sodium and, uh, and uh, aluminum, aluminum-26 and sodium-22, to be intermediately affected and, uh, you know, when you get to iodine, then you're majorly affected, perhaps. Um, and, and, the, uh, and the uranium lead series and the thorium lead series 
should be essentially the same as what we have nowadays. And, and so, at least if you're using atomic weight, there's a fairly good uh, set of predictions one can make. If you're using a, in a proportional speeding up of decay rather than half-life speeding up of decay, uh, then there are some other predictions you could make. Uh, and you can't be exact because the fact of the matter is there's a range of, for example, manganese 53 in, in, in meteorites. It's not like they all have exactly the same amount. Um, but, but even with a range, you'd, you'd, you would have some ballpark figures to guess at. And it'd be really interesting to see what those guesses turn out. Yes, could you explain and compare the dating method of the ice cores and uh, how that com compares with the other? Uh, the dating method of the ice cores, that's a, a whole subject in and of itself. I'll try to wrap it up as briefly as I can. Basically, you get rings down to 2,000 years. Now, there are corrections that need to be made at the margins. It turned out that um, Lackey uh, volcano in Iceland was observed to have uh, erupted in a particular year, and it's you know it's people noted it down, and and we know exactly when it happened. Um, and when they got down to it, they found out that they were missing six rings. So they went back and looked at it, and oh, we missed three of them. Now to me, that's malpractice. If your only job in the middle of the frozen Greenland uh, ice cap is to count rings, and you can't count rings, something is wrong here. So you say it's not accurate. Well, but it's, it's you know, it's pretty close, see. It's now, the problem is that after you get down 2,000 years, you lose the visual rings. They get packed tight enough together that they no longer, uh, you can no longer see, oh, there's a band here and another band here and another band here. And from there on, it's done by uh, things like electrical resistance, running two wires across the opposite end of it and, and seeing how, how much current you get between, uh, the, between your electrodes. And the problem with that is that you get swings and they, you know, and it's a judgment call as to where you call a year. Um, and the fact of the matter is that the last 2,000 years contains half of the record in terms of feet. That is, when they say that they've gotten 60,000 or 120,000, depending on which paper you read, and yes, it does vary that much. Because they claim there was a flood 40,000 years ago. Uh, well, like I say, take that with a um, grain of salt. Yes. Um, that, that, that last 60 or 120,000 years is compressed into probably 10% of the record. And it, it's, it's a little bit worse than that even because... Um, on the outskirts of the Greenland ice cap, there is positive testimony that shows that they are off by probably something close to an order of magnitude. Um, there were some airplanes that landed there in an emergency because they were getting out of fuel, heading towards, um, I guess, Germany or wherever during World War II. Um, maybe they were heading towards England to refuel and then go to Germany. Uh, Iceland and then, and then on over. Anyway, anyway, they 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 were running out of fuel, so they landed on the ice cap, and they just left them there. And uh, I don't know whether they pooled their fuel and then drove uh, flew on the rest of the way, or or whether they walked uh, someplace where they could get. But somehow the the airmen were rescued. They didn't find a bunch of bodies there, but they did find the planes. But when they went to get the planes, they found two very strange things. One of them was that the planes were several miles closer to the coast. So the ice cap had moved that far in, 
I think 1945 to 19, was it 80 or so? It was, it was fairly recent. Um, so we're talking like 35, 40 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that they found was when they went down to, to, to try to find them, they were under hundreds of layers. Unfortunately, nobody actually sat there and counted all the layers to, you know, give exactly how many. But it was, order, it was an order of magnitude higher than the 35 or 40 years that it was supposed to have been. Um, and so, now, everybody agrees that that can happen near the coast. The question is, what happens if you start an ice cap in the middle of Greenland? Do you get a one layer per storm? In which case you pile up a lot of layers really fast in the center. And then as you, as you get further out, the number of layers on the center decreases until it's present, which is once a year, more or less. And if that's the case, then how can we say that 60,000 layers means 60,000 years? And it gets worse when somebody tells you, well, it's actually not 60,000, it's 120,000. All of a sudden you're going, I'm not sure I can buy that whole thing. The, the ice cores are not nearly as good as radiometric dating in terms of agreeing with the present model. Uh, and the fact, the fact is that they have been kind of shoehorned into whatever the model happens to be. And it's an entirely open question as to whether uh, the ice cap even goes to back 10,000 years because there's a younger dryas in which time the ice cap probably would have melted. And that's only, by conventional dating, that's only supposed to be 10,000 years. To me, one of the most uh, questionable oh, items regarding the uh, dating of the ice caps is that when they can no longer count them visually, they do try and uh, count dust layers by uh, laser refraction, reflection, I guess it's probably reflection. Uh, they also use electrical conductivity, and they hope that the two measures match. And they, well, <laughs> and, uh, it depends on how wide a, a beam of a laser beam you want to use to get uh, your results, because you, you get finer results with a finer beam. And when they narrowed the beam down from about 10 centimeters to one centimeter, uh, they got 25,000 more layers, uh, which was added to the picture, of course. So which is uh, the real answer? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it tells you how subjective uh, you are. If we could be below that two or 3,000 layers that you, where you can see. Uh, it, it's a, it's a lot of speculation there, a lot of, and just wishful thinking. And uh, by the way, it doesn't help you to move to the Antarctic, because in the Antarctic, there is so little deposited in the center that many years don't even show up, and so all of those are estimates with you know exaggeration for. Uh, well, there must have been this, and there must have been that, and and uh, Milankovitch cycles. They go yeah, for Milankovitch that. cycles. Well, there had to be a hundred thousand years, and so it, the interpretation is extremely theory laden, and I, I don't even worry about Antarctica because the condition in Greenland it actually works for two thousand years within, like I say, small with small 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 deviations, uh, and it can be checked with other things in Antarctica. You're on your own, and you you basically fit it to whatever you want. I used to be quite concerned about the ice layers until I studied them. Um, some here today may think we're 
straying far afield from the uh, yes, topic of Genesis 1. I really don't think so because you have to apply Genesis 1, creation and God's work as creator, to the world around. And you have to, at some point, bring in radiometric dating. And Davidson and many others uh, feel that you've got to have very old minerals, you know, before creation, day one of creation. So you've got to have it, and this is a way of explaining it. Now, I have a scientific thing that I've never proposed to anyone, and I'd like to hear your reaction. About... Oh, by the way, just to reinforce your point okay. before, you, before you head into that, the claim of Yahweh is that he is the God of creation. That's what the n name means. Right. Yeah. And so creation should, if understood properly, point to him. And this is part of the point of the Elijah message, which should have some... Uh, implications for today and the first angel's message definitely yeah that that this is that this is something that if you understand creation right it actually does point to the creator mm -hmm. anyway go ahead yeah um, like I say I've never bounced the idea off of what you find in the pre-cambrian and we we usually skip over it a lot I've never heard of an Adventist expedition uh, like we did for Yellowstone Fossil Forest. I've never heard of going to Australia and spending a lot of time on the Precambrian or South Africa and the Brazilian uh, shield and Canadian shield. We don't spend a lot of time as team effort trying to reconstruct the uh, Precambrian and fit it into Genesis 1. The only one I know of who's even started on that was Robert Gentry, and he just barely got started. Exactly. A one-person job there and valiant efforts on his part. Now, um, about 35, 40 years ago, there was an article in Scientific American on the uh, sunpot, sunspot cycles in the Precambrian of Australia. Have you ever come across that? D you know, Precambrian has a lot of sediments, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are metamorphosed, but you do have sedimentary rocks, and they looked for cycles, and they found sunspot cycles in uh, the Precambrian. My, my jaw drops at that, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm going, so who is back there in the Precambrian counting sunspot cycles? Well, you can do that with any. Well, well, radiometric, no, no, but you I can mean, say I mean, who this was is, there? This no is, one was there. Th this is, and uh, the sun was presumably younger, presumably had more hydrogen and less helium. Do we really know that the sunspot cycles were the same as they are today? Uh, it, wouldn't you kind of expect that they would be different? In which case, this whole thing is. I mean, remember that. Uh, Supposedly, if you get back to the Ordovician, you have 400 days per year because this Earth was turning faster. Uh -huh. So, uh, you, you know, it's just, like I say, my jaw drops at the audacity of the assumptions that are necessary well, to make this claim. Well, before you comment any further, <laughs> I would encourage you to go back to the original article and then look at subsequent articles. Scientists went over there and did a lot more measuring, and there's about 10 or 15 years later, there are reports that these were misinterpreted, which goes along with what you're saying. <laughs> How do you interpret them? But they came up with something even more shocking, and that's the idea you have lunar tidal cycles reflected in Precambrian sediments. The lunar tidal cycles, which shortens the time period significantly. And for some reason, Adventists have never looked at this that I know of. Creationists have never looked at it. And I'm wondering why not, you know? If they're lunar cycles, they're lunar cycles because they can be tested mathematically. Uh, it would be extremely interesting to go back. And the reason, the reason that I think that would be interesting is because uh, 
again, you're dealing with something that's heavily um, uh, assumption dependent. Well, uh, all of geology it, is, no, so no, don't it, shoot it down see, on that basis. But see, all of geology right. is. Remember all that of there, it there, is, there, is, there is one mathematical model which I haven't seen a coherent criticism of. Uh, that suggests that the that the maximum age for the moon is about uh, uh, one and a half million years. Could be. Uh, I have no problem with that. And uh, in which case, if you're talking about two million year old stuff and it has lunar cycles, something is wrong here. Uh, yeah. It, okay. It, what is it? I think it was Mark Twain that was re remarking that the Mississippi River in his lifetime had shortened about a mile and a half. Yeah. And if this keeps on going pretty soon, um, Cairo, uh, where the Ohio and the Mississippi join, will become a suburb of uh, Louisiana, right? of uh, New Orleans. Yeah. And he said, and in the, what was it? I've forgotten. I think he called it the Artivision mm -hmm. and ever many million years ago that the, that the uh, Mississippi was like 6,000 miles long or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he said it's so, there is so much information you can get out of science with so little input in terms of data. Um, one thing about <laughs> these cycles is they can be mathematically tested to see if they're random or non-random. Yes, now that could be done. And you, you have to get the raw data, though, which we That's don't right. have. Well, the As other thing is, remember that non-random does not mean matching my preconceived ideas. <laughs> so, now, the bottom line. I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah. The bottom line, if, if indeed creationists study these, which we haven't, none of us have, uh, and especially with field work and measure, measurement yeah. and so on, if we do conclude that there are lunar cycles in Precambrian rock of Australia, and we say that our model places the creation of these on the third day, then this implies the sun and the moon and the earth were in their present, somewhat present cycles. Maybe the days were longer. I have no problem yeah, with their yeah. longer or Whatever. shorter. Uh -huh. All of these were already set up on the third day. That's what I'm leading up to. And yeah, it may uh, be or it may not uh, be. No, you have a very good point, and it would be very interesting for us to look at it from a different point of view because I think that our conclusions might very well be different from True. the standard ones. Good. I, I agree with that, and I think it's worth our while to go over those things again, ask how much of this is data, how much is interpretation, and then ask can you do something else with the data that doesn't, necessarily fit the standard interpretation. Right. And I think we should. For example, right. supposing it were turn, to turn out that the um, lunar cycles are roughly the same as they are today, and yeah. you were to go on and say that according to standard models, the, the, the minimum age of the moon is one million years, and when it was, let's say, a half a million years, I, I mean, let's say, let's say the standard age of the moon is four and a half million years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that the Mars-sized body that's supposed to have collided with the Earth to form the right. moon now is the standard theory now. Uh, and the moon kind of coalesced around the Earth and then started rotating uh, and going out. Uh, mm -hmm. That you would be able to say that that event happened, say, four million years ago, and yet what we have is roughly equivalent to modern cycles then that argues that whenever the, that stuff that was made in the Precambrian, that it must have been made um, not four million years ago, but perhaps within the last few thousand, to a few thousand years. So it would be very interesting to see if that works. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I just want to uh, else? add a word of caution here regarding cycles. Uh, number of studies done here on uh, cycles supposedly in corals and then um, shells uh, have shown that the 400-day Devonian year is invalid. 
Agreed. Uh, the Castile Formation, which has 200,000 layers in it, a uh, number of cycles have been claimed from there, and there's a master's thesis at the University in Texas that went into highly sophisticated mathematical analysis. Their conclusion was uh, there are no cycles in, the, in Castile. Uh, good. That what you have is random variation with uh, uh, you can you can impose cycles if you want to matching enough of it to you work. You find what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, the same thing is true with tree rings, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The uh, statistical tests for tree rings can give you just tremendous correlations. They mean nothing. Uh, well, a lot of that is. is uh, uh, Insects go in cycles, and sometimes the insect uh, infestation can affect the thickness of the rings. That has been documented from the literature. Not only that, but you can have cycles that look like they should match, and it turn out they don't. Over uh, a long time period, they can get them to match. No, they didn't say that the cast seal were not annual ones. I'm talking about oh. these. I'm talking about these larger cycles beyond the 200,000. Yeah, uh, there is. That, that ecliptic is, cycles, that is, uh, like astronomical cycles. They, they get into really, that really gets highly, you need to be very careful about the data you have. I'm, I'm not, data. I don't want to mix apples and oranges. I'm not talking about the, uh, the cycles of perturbations of the Earth's orbits. That's astronomical, where you have 22,000 year and, and so on. I'm talking about something that we see today, and that's lunar cycles. It'll be interesting, we can, to, it'll be interesting anyway, to look at we the data can and, re, and uh, you know, see if there's a lunar versus daily and, and see how yeah, it fits. You no, can get daily, I, too. I think we should go into these kinds of areas. We need to be skeptical because that's part of science. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be looking for ways to construct because when we start nailing our predictions, that's when we're doing science. Which is why when I did carbon-14, I did a paper first saying what I'm expecting, and mm -hmm. then went back and looked at the literature and see what we got. And then I said, that's not enough. Let's do some actual experiments of our own. And uh, I still think that there's one or two more experiments to do. Um, and uh, I think that our job is not just to describe what we see, but is to put together models that actually can predict. Did you want to say anything more? Oh, okay. uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you have time, but sure. I'm not really a scientist, but I have, uh, I've always wondered about the, the rotations of the Earth, and we have the ice poles, and apparently other planets have ice poles too, but Yet, we, they find uh, plants and things under the ice. Now, what, what does that mean? It would have to mean that at some point the Earth tilted, or uh, it was in certainly not the same rotation as well, it is now. The Earth was much warmer before before they had uh, the, carbon. It, carbon uh, yeah, it uh, is reasonable to put that into, at the poles of a, of a perhaps that that seasons were not the same before the flood as they are now. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow it was warmer. That's the pretty much absolute explanation. Somehow it was warmer at one time in Greenland than it is now. Because when they get down to the, the ice cores, they find stuff underneath yeah, it. Uh, dinosaur fossils and, and things like that. Yeah, uh, well not only fossils, but there's actually <laughs> preserved green stuff at the bottom. Or, you know, well, kind it of saying the whole, by now, the whole Earth was warmer then? No question about it. Uh, I, I think that's the, the reasonable... So uh, the sun is not the same as it was then. Uh, and well, something was different. Maybe we had a better, uh, maybe we had a better greenhouse effect. Maybe we had better uh, uh, equality between the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the temperatures of day and night. Wouldn't you've had longer? Couldn't couldn't we have had much longer days? It's possible, although there are built-in circadian rhythms that are meant to lock us into day-night, and uh, there, there's a reason why people who sleep at the same time do better sleeping than people who are trying to do otherwise. 
And you'll find that out if you ever jet to, um, let's say, Europe or Australia. You're going to be off, and you're going to know it. And it's going to take you two or three days to kind of get readjusted. But would you have longer nights and longer days, I assume. Well, it's just different times. The, see, I had this problem when they put the 24 hours into the uh, fundamental uh, beliefs thing. It, it, uh, how would we know that? I, it just didn't seem like it, it wasn't there. It wasn't yeah. any evidence for it. Well, I prefer, rather than saying 24 hour, to say evening, morning. Yeah, okay. Because I think that's more accurate. But I, I, I and, and it might have been 25 hours, it might have been 23 hours, but I really don't think it was 64 hours. Or that it was 12. Mm -hmm. That is, I, I don't think the day has changed that much. But, of course, again, that's my opinion. We'll come on back next week, and we'll uh, we'll look at Genesis. Uh, we'll look at creation in the rest of the Pentateuch.